go. Did you press it? I did. Okay. Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce. And I'm Leslie Elliott. Boyce? Yeah. Okay. Well, that tells me everything that I want to, to tell you. Uh, and this is a piece of content that's from a year ago. This is mine and Leslie's first conversation. She had uh, started standing up against some woke twattery at her university and got a lot of traction with that and a lot of people put me on her radar and so I reached out to her. She was kind enough to join Benjamin Boyce. I don't know what you thought of me beforehand. What do you, Well, I, I thought you were... I had listened to a lot of your interviews and I thought you were great. I Oh. And I thought you were kind of flirty mm. with women. Oh, with women. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. I thought you had a little bit of a flirty thing. Was that a on. red flag? I don't know. It wasn't much of a flag. It was just something interesting about you. It was just you. something that you yeah. thought about me. Yeah. Well, I've, I've reformed myself and no longer <laughs> flirty with women. Um, yeah, so that, w that was a year ago. And over the course of uh, that uh, last uh, year, we met up and our lives have kind of come together and really... Uh, not so novel fashion. I mean, people get married all the time, but it's. I always thought it would be fun to put that first conversation up. We can look at it and uh, see uh, where we started and yeah. how our you know our rapport was mm -hmm. at that time in our lives and how professional and not flirty you were. Oh, I was so not flirty. You were not. No, I didn't no. want to flirt with you. I was scared. What? Yeah, you, you, you came on. Well, you see, oh, watch the video. Watch the video. You're so poised oh, okay. that I couldn't be flirty oh, until like a couple shows in. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanking me? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> enjoy. Nice star curtains. I, I landed on this um, for trying to be kind of fancy, but not too fancy. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. I like it. I was doing green screen for a really long time, but it's always kind of crummy. I could never get yeah. it like really good um, with my setup. So I went with the black background and I like it. It's very flat, but it was too flat. So mm -hmm. I wanted to put something. Just well, it looks hint. like you're in space, which is cool. Yeah. Floating in space. <laughs> I think it has a calming effect on, on the <laughs> guest. They feel like, oh, I'm talking to Starman. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> What's in that cup there? Uh, this is bedtime tea. Oh, wow. I know. Perfect. I for over caffeinated myself. <laughs> oh, okay. So, this so is you're my speed antidote. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm wild like that. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, munching on valerian root and uh, chocolate covered coffee beans. You get both, both, best, both. both at, at the same time. Yep. Yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, so where whereabouts are you in Northern and Southern California? No, I'm in Washington. Um, oh. Yeah, I live just northeast of Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I just live southwest of Seattle. So. Are, you, are you in Olympia? Yeah, I'm in Olympia. Okay. Well, yeah. actually, technically in an unincorporated township outside mm -hmm. of Olympia, but it's basically... I used to really like Olympia. Really? It was did, such a cool place. Yeah. Did you ever think about going to Evergreen? No. I didn't. No. No. I I didn't. I moved up here in 2009 and I was I moved uh, from Texas. I'm from San Antonio. And I moved up to go to law school. I was at Seattle U. And um when I decided that I I wanted to leave that track I took a long break and I didn't go back to academia till 2019. And in the meantime, Evergreen went nuts. So it was never even on my radar to like think about going there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I saw how that kind of went down. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Uh, so y y you didn't expect it to meet up with you at another college though? Um, no, I mean, I think I was kind of, I, I didn't really have a concept of how pervasive this was. I knew that there were like rumblings and that the culture was shifting and, um, but I didn't have, I, I, I didn't really have a way to articulate it. I didn't understand what was going on really. I feel a little bit shell shocked by it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so just for context, uh, what, mm -hmm. what decided you on law school and what decided you on not law school? To just go um, back. So I was 
uh, I guess that's kind of a long story. I, um, I was a real um, poor student in grade school. I uh, had a very bad experience with school. <laughs> and um, I, I did very poorly. I'll say well, attention uh, or boredom. Yeah. Or? Yeah. All of it. I think it, so I was considered a smart kid. I was in the gifted classes and stuff, but I think I had, I had ADHD issues that were undiagnosed and I had a very hard time focusing and this was treated as a discipline problem. Really? So yeah. Were you acting was, out? Or? No, no. It's just huh. like my my work wasn't. I wasn't turning in work. I was struggling to, you know, I do well on tests, but I would do really poorly on homework and assignments. And so I was always on academic probation from like middle school through high school. And I um, huh. also there were just social issues. You know, I uh, was what in. I, I'm from South Texas, from San Antonio, from a poor area, and. I was, um, you know, one of the only white kids in my grade school. I was picked on quite a bit and had some bullying issues. But anyway, I, I assume kind of mostly Hispanic or yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, law school. I guess I, I had my my first child. I was pregnant by eighteen and had my first child at nineteen. And then my second at 21, I was married, but um, my first husband. And I felt like such a, like a disappointment to my family. And I think I really wanted to do something to, especially to make my father proud. And, you know, he'd always said, you should, you should be an attorney. You should be a lawyer. And I think I, I started down that road partly because I thought I could redeem myself a little bit by doing something um, that would give me that status and that respect in within my family. I felt like a bit of a black sheep. Hmm. So, and, and then when I got there, um, I really, I really hated it. It oh, was yeah. like, yeah, law school was just miserable for me. I, oh, I no. hated every minute of it. Oh, no. I realized this is not what I want to do. Wait, did your dad think you'd be a good lawyer because you were always arguing with each other? Probably. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. And so, the, the, was it the climate or the or the the studies of law that that didn't I didn't like? Have? Yeah. Um, well, I uh, probably a little bit of both. I mean, the legal studies are that's that's pretty interesting. Legal research is pretty interesting, but um, the climate was awful. I could get through that though. It was very competitive, and I'd always heard law school is competitive, and I thought that's no problem. I can do well in a competitive environment, but I didn't realize. It wasn't just academically competitive they were talking about. It was like socially, like pretty vicious. It wasn't a comfortable, nice place to be. It was pretty backbiting and um, I don't know. Well, I and wonder then the why. Socratic Maybe method the, sucks. Oh, the Socratic method sucks. That, yeah, like standing up, having to stand in front of 80 people that, you know, are already, you know, in vicious competition with each other and be called on for minute details of case law when you stayed up like literally four or five hours the night before just trying to read all the stuff you had to read for all your classes the next day and how you're supposed to recall these like little tiny details and you're on the spot and you have to stand in this like auditorium and and the the teacher is like grilling you it's it's like a nightmare socially for for Jeez. people who don't like to pub to do public speaking yeah yeah how, how long but did that, you last yeah. doing that I I left in my second year. There's law school three years long. I left in the second year. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And th then what? You just hung out among the trees in Washington. <laughs> um, well, I had gone to when I'd done undergrad. I'd, I'd gone for a psychology major, and I sort of thought that I, I really um, was on the fence when I decided to go ahead and apply to law school. So I was really on the fence about that. I thought maybe I wanted to do graduate study in psychology. And so I started right away looking at counseling programs when I, when I was like daydreaming in law school about leaving it. Yeah. And then I met, um, I met uh, my uh, husband 
and had two more children oh. in the meantime. So busy, yeah. busy bee. Yeah. So I took a little break raising babies. And what attracted you or attracts you to psychology? The theory, the practice, the praxis? What is it about it? Mm, I think just the understanding, understanding yourself, understanding others, human behavior is fascinating. Why we do what we do and how we could, how we could become more content in our lives. What, what makes a good life? What is good? What is evil? You know? Just all these questions. Yeah. What it means to be a human. See, so you're not after the power to manipulate the psyches of your... <laughs> no. Okay. So some people, no, I'm sure, yeah. get into psychology to do that. but. Yeah, I think um, what my mother was... Uh, she had a really hard life. She had a really, really hard life. Her Her childhood was really sad and full of abuse and foster care and... Um, just her uh, ACE score, average, average childhood event score would have been off the chart. And she was, she talked to me a lot when I was a little kid, you know, I was kind of like her, it was like this parentified child role where yeah. I sit and listen to my mom. And I just, I developed such a, a deep empathy for what it must have been like to be her and how lonely she was in that. And so I guess that's kind of my, that's my, maybe my first, <laughs> first experience with counseling, right? It's just yeah. sitting with somebody and just hearing and just giving them a place to talk. So, yeah. yeah. How many uh, brothers and sisters you got? I have two brothers and then I have a stepsister. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 2019 rolls around. You're like, I'm tired of being a mom. I want to I wanna get back <laughs> into the workforce or something like that. Um, what caused you to, how did you do the choice of which school to go to, which program? Well, honestly, I, I didn't take that much. I didn't give it that much thought. I was looking at programs that were convenient to where I lived. I lived in Green Lake in Seattle. And... Um, I wanted to go to somewhere I could go in person. I looked at a couple of different universities. I wanted to get, uh, I, I wasn't looking, I wasn't doing a lot of research. I wasn't looking for some high um, status school. I just wanted a place where I could go get my foundations and get my degree yeah. and come out with a master's. I chose Antioch because I went to a couple of their info sessions, talked with a recruiter, went and listened to, um, one of their, um, I guess they do like a new student sort of prospective student seminar thing where they have teachers come up and present and other students from the program. And I thought they sounded really good. Yeah. So there's yeah. more than one Antioch university, isn't there? Yeah. They okay. have, um, at least one in California and one in, um, there's the new England online program. And I think they might have a campus in Ohio or New Hampshire. Is it is it all the same or they're just uh, converged on? I think it's all the, the same. same. Okay. Yeah, I okay. think it's all the same. Yeah. Okay. So were you really excited to get back to going to school? And how was it that first getting back on campus? Got your pencils all <laughs> sharpened, a little tote bag? Yeah, it was great. I really was excited. Um, and my first couple of classes were really good. I had um, a family of origin class that was really good where you do this deep dive on your, like your genealogy and your um, patterns that have been recurring and intergenerationally in your family. And you can really kind of see how the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And that was super cool. Um, and then we did a counseling communication and skills class. The teacher was phenomenal and it was really a it was just a great, like, hands-on skills learning class. Those were my first two, and I really enjoyed the way it started. And there was no, no, um, <coughs> excuse me, mm. whiff of the social justice going on? There was yeah. a little. Huh. Yeah, it was like the pronoun thing. They started that right yeah. away, and I thought that was really 
strange. It seemed really, um, it, it seemed psychologically unhealthy and I couldn't really put my finger on why, but it took me a while to really articulate that and parse it. But I just thought that doesn't seem right. <laughs> but I kind of, I went with it one time just once during a group interview where we were asked for third person pronouns and I, I gave mine and it felt so wrong to do that, that I've never done it again. Huh. What would you n not do? How would you not do it when it came around again? Um, when I was asked, I would just say, I have no special requests, Okay. which kind of stumps them for a second, but then they keep moving. Cause you know, yeah. Yeah. And did you like make eye contact with anybody else feeling uncomfortable about it? No, I never really saw anybody seem uncomfortable with it. Okay. It was just kind of accept accepted. No, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about the radicalization factor? You're in a graduate program, so it's not going to be as uh, rough and tumble as undergraduates, but were there, uh, was your cohort um, peppered with fundamentalist uh, kinds of uh, progressives? Yeah, it started to really um, stand out to me. It was uh, like my uh, best friend in the program, really nice girl. I'm, I don't, we haven't kept in touch, but w she was like somebody I really um, got, got to know right away and got along with very well, um, would say things like, she said, cishet white men one day. And I was like, what does that mean? And she's, she had to explain it to me. I didn't understand what she was saying. She was complaining about cishet white men. And I'm like, what did we do to her? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was something, assumably it was, she, everything, but it was a class she was taking and she was complaining about how all the, the people in the class that were off offensive or the problem or whatever, were always the cishet white men. And I, I had to have her explain that to me. And then it, it, I didn't really know what to say back. It was so strange to me. I thought, but you're married to a white guy and you have a white son. And, and yet you're going to like smear them all with this one, like paint them all with the same brush. Yeah. It was odd. So, yeah, I think people, it was like a, that, that was the atmosphere where people talked like that. And um, the pronoun thing, I mean, there were, there were women who wore makeup and, and, dresses and called themselves they you know yeah so i was seeing that and i had not seen that before it was just kind of out of it i worked i i never i worked in a natural medicine clinic for six years leading up to that and um i have children and i kind of just been out of the loop i had not been in the academic field where this stuff was really ramping up so it, it felt strange to you yeah. Did you, um, so when did you do your undergrad? What years? About? Um, I graduated in 2008. Okay. Yeah. Um, so kind of a different era, um, mm -hmm. but did you have yeah. like a feminist phase? I, I, maybe you're a feminist now. Did you ever have like a kind of a peak activism phase for you? No. Where you're like, I'm going to change the world. No, Save I didn't. I, I, <laughs> I had sort of an environmentalist phase. I guess, which I, I think, uh, in San Antonio, where all the water comes from a karst aquifer system, and it's the Edwards Aquifer, and so there's this, uh, there's a lot of politicking around the aquifer re recharge zone, which is this beautiful bit of land, this beautiful area, that is very desirable for builders. But it's also the recharge zone where if rainfall doesn't hit that, we're not going to get our water supply replenished. And also, if they start building a bunch of stuff over there, you're going to have VOCs run off into the aquifer, which is naturally fil filtered, you know, through the karst limestone. And um, so I was a part of a couple of groups that were working on on uh, preventing. Like, it was just a very specific, like, environmental issue. Yeah. But that was kind of where where my mind was. And I had thought about going into environmental law or farm law. So that was kind of where I was, but feminism, not really. I, I always, uh, I feel like I don't really understand the waves of feminism. You could probably find one where I would line up maybe second wave or first wave where I think that we should have equal rights and equal respect, but I don't know about pushing. I don't know. 
Indivi- I'm, I'm more into individualism, you know, I mean, I think individuals should be able to make up, you know, what roles do you want to fulfill and not so much about the division. And feminism has seemed really divisive to me. Hmm. So. so it never really spoke to you? Not really. Not, I mean, from the standpoint of feeling like women and men are of equal value and should have equal respect in the world, then yes, but not, yeah. I wasn't a part of any kind of movement. And religion? Did you grow up religious? Your family religious at all? No, not at all. Okay. Yeah. Not at all. Okay. No, did you ever have a, a, a drive or a curiosity about religion? Um, I, as a kid, I felt like bullied by the the Christians. That was one of the things that I, it wasn't just like a racial thing. It was also like, it's a very Catholic, very Christian Catholic kind of area. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was definitely going to hell, <laughs> according to um a lot of people and uh you know you couldn't be atheist you couldn't be agnostic you couldn't be just somebody who doesn't go to church we had a woman who uh uh called my family heathens (laughs) because we wouldn't uh my parents wouldn't send the kids to church and there were confrontations over it so i grew up kind of antagonistic to religion okay and i went to a catholic university in texas and it was the first time I was um, forced to actually sit down with the Bible and really read. And I, it really opened my mind quite a bit. How so? so reading the New Testament and reading um, the teachings of Christ, I, I, it changed. I had, my impression was always pretty much given to me by these people who were not good representatives. Yeah. So it, was, um, it softened me quite a bit, yeah. actually having to engage with the work. Yeah, the the thing about social justice um, is that if you go back to their uh, their Christ, their teachings mm-hmm. of Christ, it's a big mangle. So they don't really have one book, but when you get into it, it's kind of this really interesting stuff that isn't very Christ-like in its uh, um, opinions mm-hmm. on human nature and what it wants to accomplish. So the seed of social justice, the the founding texts themselves are a little off, um, you know, with uh, postmodernism and. Mm-hmm. oppression theory and conflict theory and stuff like that. And then also the revolutionary uh, doctrines of like, uh, what's his name? Rules for Radicals? I can't think of his name. I should think of his name. Uh, or I should know his name. But um, So when you started to see, I bring up the religion aspect because when I went to Evergreen, I grew up in a uh, pastor's kid, always mm-hmm. going to church, just mm-hmm. always in the middle of Christianity. And when I went to Evergreen, I'm like, oh, you guys are trying to do church. Like you're trying Mm -hmm. to have a church, but it's super cringe. It's super duper cringe, but you're still, you don't know that you've recreated this kind of religious fervor Um, Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. it all like it, before it all exploded, they started to do these rituals in Mm -hmm. a very explicit way. Um, So I was just like, I could see it. Um, so socially, like as a sociological phenomenon, and then I could also kind of feel how it was going to, where it was going to mm-hmm. lead, because you could start to see the kids internalize this, and then just kind of see that they can gain ultimate power. Um, mm-hmm. But like a two-year-old's version of ultimate power, where you just get to scream at people. Mm-hmm. So, so you had a frame of reference for this. And yeah, you I had could a frame. Really kind of already see it fitting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so did you have to build a frame? You're building a frame now. Like when you started to see it get stronger and stronger around you, how did you start to react to it or think about um, it? I think it. I think it took me a little while to really understand what was happening. I. I mean, I. I wasn't completely culturally clueless, so I'm listening to things. I'm. I'm. Uh, I had discovered Jordan Peterson, for instance, not too long before starting that program, maybe around the same time. So I'm hearing this stuff. I'm kind of, uh, but I, I think that uh, I didn't, I developed an, a way to understand it slowly. And I was at first just kind of engaging with it on face val- at face value. So the first course where, and I talked about this in the videos a lot. The first um, class where this was really introduced in the program was this multicultural perspectives course, which really seemed out of place in the program because um, my 
my two prior courses and and most of my subsequent courses have been more even though they have that social justice flavor to them sometimes some more than others they've been more like developing different skill sets and, and working on different theories that you would expect you'd, you'd have in a psychology program, an applied psychology program. But this class was really like, it was taught at a very low intellectual level huh. and it was really reductionist. So it's like she was doing, as I said in that first video, the addressing model, which is using the word addressing as an acronym to cover a bunch of different um a, a bunch of different demographic characteristics. So age, disability acquired, disability, genetic, uh, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, indigenous status. What is the N? National, national origin, origin, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And then um, gender, a gender identity or gender. Okay. But so you get the idea though. And so yeah. it's a, it's like a binary scale where you can get either get a score of marginalized or privileged. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is like, this is being taught and I'm like, why, are, why are we dissecting people in this way in a psychology program? Like of all places, wouldn't we have a deeper understanding of humanity than that? How is that making any sense? And so I was kind of just grappling with these things, honestly, and I'm sort of, like this, this was the first time I'd really had it served up really blatantly, you know, not just like, oh, we're going to slide the pronouns in on the side or we're going to, you know, make some comment about white privilege, but it's just kind of in passing, you know, this class was like right there in your face. And so yeah. I thought maybe this teacher was just kind of teaching from a more simple minded perspective. Maybe this is just some she's she's doing her own take on the curriculum and i can actually engage with her and talk to her about why these things seem uh like illogical and i i i didn't realize that this was like the distilled essence of what social justice really is hmm. um so yeah it was kind of a gradual process of understanding it and at that time it was a lot of cognitive dissonance for me i was really stressed it was uh I was like, she can't really be saying this, can she? This yeah. isn't really what they think, is it? And I'm, I'm like trying to write these like long arguments against this stuff, really rational, like coming alongside and saying, well, I can see the points here and here. But when you look at this, like this doesn't hold up. This isn't, you know, we, we shouldn't, we don't know something of substance about a person's character or experiences just by looking at their observable characteristics. Yeah. I mean, that seems like it's pretty basic, but. And the feedback that you got? Uh, she told me at one point that I sh um, should use my white privilege. <laughs> it was like about white privilege and about how I'm such a privileged person and that I shouldn't center my, my needs and that I should, uh, you know, it was just, it was like the social justice talking points. Yeah. Did you... This this might be a bad question, but did you get a sense of like her her soul or her character? Like, was she trapped in this? Was she a true believer in this? And did it cause her to be happy or or the opposite of happy? Like psychologically, it seemed speaking? like yeah. This teacher was like she was a young woman. She was younger than I was. Um, I wasn't super young at the time, but she was like definitely at least a decade younger than me. And she was a blonde haired, um, light skinned person who seemed like she had this, this idea that because her, her mother was from, uh, I don't remember where she was from Latin America, I guess. So this was her like, get out of jail free card. Like, I'm not actually white. You think I'm white. She said, you think you would think by looking at me that I'm just a basic bitch and a Becky, <laughs> but and I'm going to, and I'm going to go ahead and check the marginalized box for race because I'm, I'm actually not white. And so it was this whole, like, I feel like she was clinging to this allyship or this, this identity of, of the marginalized person as like social currency and uh, spent the whole course talking about herself. Just the whole course was like, how, how does this, how I see this through my marginalized eyes, you know? marginalized eyes <laughs> <laughs> i just made that up but uh, yeah the good one you didn't say that huh. mm -hmm. so 
if if you're doing a counseling uh, and mm-hmm. and you get a person like this on the couch, mm-hmm. how do you begin to um, erode their clingingness to this way of viewing the world in order to address possibly underlying conditions? How would well, you treat I, somebody that's locked into that? I guess what what I think of when I think of uh, my role, and I I don't I won't be a counselor because I'm not finishing this program, but I do work as a coach, and I do work with clients. I don't I don't want to bring ideology in, not mine or theirs. I want to not remake the person if they believe something. Okay. I'll challenge cognitive distortions. If I hear something that seems like a contradiction of something else, I'll bring that up and ask them, you know, ask them about it and we'll talk about it and kind of play with it. But I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't worked with somebody who was like a real social justice warrior, but I don't know that it would be my place to really, Hmm. you know, neither, neither talk them into that ideology nor talk them out of it, but rather to find out what their, worldview is and sort of come alongside and hear it from their perspective, help them work through their, their patterns, their goals. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know that I would, I don't, I don't want to superimpose my worldview necessarily, but I'll be honest about what I think. I mean, I'll be honest to some extent, not going to tell you too much about me. It's not about me, but if I'm hearing something, I'll, I'll raise it back up, you know? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't just, articulate that. Well, no, well. no, 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 no. You, you did well. And it's a hypothetical question. So it would totally depend on the personality that you're sitting with and the actual person that you're sitting yeah. with. But I'm just thinking of that person, that teacher that you're just talking about as a type um, <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, a type with a lot of power or a type that has been molded by power to fit into a system of power. And mm-hmm. the social justice ideology is just, a, it's, it's like, uh, you know, those diversity statements that everybody has to give uh, now, mm-hmm. like even to yep. get a teaching gig, you need to believe in diversity, equity, and then like give your creds. Which it, is why I can't finish my program. Oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. so you're not, it, 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 at a certain point in Western uh, you know, history, Latin was used as a barrier mm-hmm. to entry into the elite, and it's this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff that's a barrier of entry. If you can swallow this mm-hmm. pill and regurgitate mm-hmm. it, then you are, then power knows that you're going to play the game, or power yeah. knows that you actually will forward itself, which is just the encroachment of this ideology into every given aspect of life. And that's what, when I first started speaking out about this coming, well, I was still at Evergreen, like my first video on Evergreen was at Evergreen. Um, I saw it as a way of viewing people that reduces that, that is looking at them from a demographic point of view, not as Mm -hmm. an individual at all. And like, Mm -hmm. like taking the individual and kind of putting it through a cheese grater until it's just these aspects. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that has a lot of different consequences in behavior down the road Mm -hmm. where you Mm -hmm. don't see another human being. You don't have any caps on your behavior because you're Mm -hmm. acting out this historical battle. You're, you're Mm -hmm. superhuman in a way, but you're very less than human in, in effect. So I'm just, uh, you know, thinking of that teacher as a type and how would you speak to them? How would you, undermine them and i guess you're saying well it's it's up to them i'm not going to go toe to toe or something like that but well i guess it if i were it would be different if i'm if i were in the counselor's role or the coach's role as i see it okay yeah i feel like that's all about it's not an it's not like a direct sort of conflictual undermining as much as it is like i think that you would get you would subtly and eventually chip away at that just by seeing them as an individual and refusing to play. So it's like, just as you're seeing them as a type, they see us as a type or or everybody as types. Right. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't, I would say that even that's my response to that is I don't think that these people are types either. I think that these are individuals and you can be in the grips of, 
religious fervor and passion, but still be an individual. And there's still a whole lot of substance within every person that you can find to connect to and to relate to and to, to work on enriching and bringing out those other aspects of character. And through that, I think you can, you, I think that a lot of what we're seeing in terms of types is just this internet mentality this like, you know, social media just presents these really, um, these really shallow versions of ourselves. And so it's so easy to end up typecasting everybody. And I, that it's, it's sort of like this, this collectivist mind virus that infects you whether, no matter what side of it you're on, like the, the, this side is collectivist, but if you become polarized against it, you become polarized in a collectivist frame. Yeah. Does that make no, sense? No, it does. Am yeah, I no, it does. It does. Uh, I've, I've spoken about that uh, specifically with, uh, at a certain phase, there was this thing called the anti-woke, which I was oh. just by dent to the fact of the work that I was doing, I was in the anti-woke camp and I saw that mm -hmm. the people who were getting mm -hmm. the most attention, the people who were benefiting from being anti-woke were feeding mm -hmm. into this re reflective reactionary mm -hmm. mocking. We're going to, we're going to laugh at these pink haired weirdos. We're going to laugh mm -hmm. at these 17 year olds who are obviously mentally disturbed, right? but they're spewing this um, unbelievably idiotic crap, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of, kind of started to distance myself from that because you're just, you're, you're setting up yourself to re, to respond and, and then to look for more of that response, that outrage response, which is the same thing that's fueling the other side. So it's a political, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody gets dirty in that. And it's really exactly. difficult to, it's difficult to walk the line between getting the attention Mm -hmm. that you need to do this work that I'm doing and mm -hmm. not being kind of trapped by that attention. I can imagine. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing is like resisting, resisting that, that polarization is so difficult because it goes, it's, it, it's so easy to do. It's yeah. so easy to become the anti yeah. whatever it is. And I think that it's harder to find the center and find the middle path and, and kind of, I, I think that, um, yeah, even like somebody like that teacher, we're using her as an example, and I don't mean to call her out so much because she's this, I, actually, this is, this is a great thing to say, I guess, um, or way to say it. She's a person. She's a human being. She has, you know, family and she has, I'm sure she has friends. I'm sure, I'm sure she has romantic interests. I'm sure she has movies that she loves and books that she loves and things that are that are amazing about her and that she can work on and channel her energy into and that make her so much more than just this one person pushing this one ideology in this way. And I don't want to see people that way. And I don't want to, yeah. I, I, I want to resist that. And I, I know, I think that this is something that is really dangerous and it's being pushed from somewhere. These programs, this, this kind of social movement, it's not occurring grassroots. It's being hmm. funded. It's being, I mean, we don't, you're not going to see like just grassroots DEI across the whole country and the UK that looks exactly the same. So this is, there's a, some origin of what's going on. And I don't know, I'm not going to, I'll sound dumb if I start to try to speculate. I'll sound like I'm a tinfoil hat or whatever. Well, it, but, yeah. but it's coming from somewhere, I believe. And so I do think that we shouldn't passively just allow that. It's nice to, to ferret that out and stop it. And we should stop it at the school board and we should stop it in our institutions. But as far as us and them, I think us and them is the problem, hmm. you know, uh, with each other. It's a divide and conquer sort of thing. I mean, if you get everybody fight amongst amongst themselves then you know yeah you balkanize whatever and then you munch up all the resources or get your way because people mm -hmm. are distracted by these other things but mm -hmm. what about anger um so let's so you, you see the stuff ramping up you're like wait mm -hmm. what wait what yeah do you start does it does it start to cross a line for you where you're like um, 
this is wicked or something like that, where you start to have strong feelings or bad dreams or something like that. Well, that class was really awful for me. I was, I mean, I was like, um, I, my first, the first way that I approached it was like personal. It was to say, well, how can you say that, that these racial differences are so, so stark? How can you say that you give us this white privilege checklist and tell us that we're all privileged? And then, but I'm looking at this list and I can't check a lot of these because I did grow up a, a racial minority and I know what that feels like. So I'm not saying that that is, and I guess it, that was hard for me because I don't want to wave a victim flag. I don't want to do that. I don't think any, you know, I don't think that that's a healthy mindset and I'm yeah. not going to do that. And just like I wouldn't encourage somebody else to do that, I'm not going to do it myself. But it was my own experiences. And I was saying, look, you can't say that I would check these just because you can look at me and see that I'm light colored. Yeah. Um, and so I tried to argue it from that standpoint with, within the class. And it was really a, quite a humiliating experience for me. The, uh, the teacher, I, I wrote to her about it. And she said, I encourage you to share this in class because this would be a good conversation. So why don't you talk about it in the class? And she used it as an opportunity to ambush me, <laughs> which was really bad. Yeah. You got struggle session by your uh, own teacher. <laughs> I did. Yeah. She told me that I needed to, she, she had me tell my little thing. And so I just gave a little story. It was just like, uh, you know, brief narrative, kind of like what I just said to you. It's not, not, not a lot of detail. And she said, uh, I, and I'm, I don't remember what, it, her quote was, but I remember the word reparent. She told me that I should go back and reparent myself so that I can be uh, a competent counselor and not do harm to my Latino clients in the future. And she said this out loud in front of the whole class. And it was just like, wow, that is really humiliating. I have always seen this as more of a strength than a weakness. I've always seen this as like, I can understand what it's like to be the underdog. And I can really like, yeah. I can really relate to a feeling of being uh, on the outside. And, and so this is a strength that I can bring. And she was casting it as I'm the villain now because I was bullied. Now I'm going to be like this vengeful, dangerous therapist in the future. Who's going to like be s seeking oh, revenge against okay. my Latino. And it was like, wow, that's just not a image of myself I ever had. And now you just said that in front of 20 people. But reparent. So basically, she wants you to brainwash yourself to think the way that she does about you. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Like so. actually, go back into your past and rewrite your historical narrative by being the adult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I I really took exception to that phrase, that word yeah. being used. It was uh, it was incredibly condescending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said anger. I. Uh, I don't know if I ever felt super angry, maybe a little bit, but more, I just felt very misunderstood and I sort of internalized that. And so it was, it was just really a hard, I, I was questioning everything, you know, like, yeah. do I, do I leave this program? Do I quit? I mean, I'm, I'm older and I'm retraining into a new field. I don't really want to give that up. Yeah. yeah reparenting. Yeah. <laughs> I was reparenting, I guess. It was just like, I was very confused yeah. and I was, I did feel a lot of resentment towards what was happening, but I also started to become aware that was happening everywhere. So I didn't feel like I could leave. Oh, and, unless oh I so there's no way up. out. No matter Not where in, you would go, it would follow you. In the mental health field, it seems like that. It seems like it's pretty universally captured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was either like give up on this and go figure something else out or go back to working at the doctor's office and not ever go to get my goals, you know, my educational goals fulfilled. Can I felt like I might as well stick it out. And I tried. When the evergreen thing happened and mm -hmm. I started to speak out about it, you know, um, man, it took me up several years to tell the whole story or mm -hmm. as far as I wanted to, but those first three or four months, 
I was actively, I could feel myself deprogramming myself. I could feel myself going through and challenging all these things that I never agreed with, mm -hmm. but because I was totally surrounded, like, and I had to subconsciously train myself not to say this thing, not to say that thing. Mm -hmm. And then because I couldn't say it, then I couldn't think it. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so in the process of thinking it, like, I'm like, oh, okay, I can say this. I can, I, I can say that certain people are dumb and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what color their skin is. Like you're just, mm -hmm. you're, you're an idiot and your race doesn't protect you from the fact that you are acting like a evil person, like that, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that, just for mm -hmm. example and stuff. Um, so how, how long how long were you in this program and so i started in uh i guess it was spring of 2019 and my last class was this summer okay and i have i took a leave of absence okay. after this summer so is that three years and uh during the pandemic you guys were all online or was there in-person things going on during the i lockdown? yeah i i transferred out of the Seattle program due to the problems with this, this coursework. And I already had enough credits and I'd spent enough money that I was worried about losing them if I transferred to a different school altogether. So the solution that was offered to me by the chair of the department at Antioch, Seattle, was to coordinate transfer to Antioch, New England. And I don't know, it was like a gamble. I just took a chance to see if maybe it would be a better program. Yeah. And it's an online program. So I transferred right before the the COVID. Okay. And you, mm -hmm. so you were already online. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. that specific uh, addressing course? Or were there other courses in person? There, that... Well, so that course um, was, it was so bad that um, I complained. She, uh, the professor didn't give anybody, it, it, you're supposed to do like evaluations mid quarter and then at the end of the quarter she didn't offer us that chance for feedback to give our feedback and then at the end of the quarter when i got my narrative evaluation because that's how antioch does them is a narrative she uh, actually wrote on my permanent academic record that i needed mental health therapy to get over my racial issues so she actually she took out my my intellectual disagreements with the curriculum and with the way she taught it she uh, marked that down as a psychological problem in me on my record. And I thought this was a tremendous abuse of power. And so I filed, I, I called, I uh, spoke with the chair to, to get a grievance going. Yeah. And uh, they, I was persuaded not to file a grievance because they, they said that they'd gotten a number of other complaints about this teacher and they were going to be uh, reviewing her for whether to retain her or not. The chair seemed to be taking this very seriously. Yeah. And I felt like, okay, I'm going to let it go. Um, and then the next, the next quarter, I had another class where there were some other issues that, that happened that were pretty, um, that, that were not good. Anyway, so I tried to. Wait, 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 at wait, the wait, wait. That, okay. I want the juicy bits. <laughs> Which part? Well, the, the things that are not okay. I want the traumas. <laughs> well, so that, that course was. Uh, the problems that I had in that course were more to do with the organization. It wasn't so much social justice. Okay, it was well, like, this school is a disorganized mess. Oh, okay. So, yeah, like, um, we, we had this, the, the teacher was really nice. She was, she seemed like a, a, a good teacher. Um, she gave out, we, we did our finals, we turned them in we had people get a grade on them. And then a month later, when we're already into our next quarter, she revoked that grade for a lower grade. It was like all kinds of funny business like that. It was administrative stuff that happened throughout the quarter. And it was just, it was like, it would take me too long and it would be too boring a story okay, to tell okay. you. It was all just right. like really disorganized. And okay. so I was like, It wow, wasn't like corruption. Program. It was just idiocy. Idiocy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and I realized also that they had not, in fact, taken my concern seriously because that teacher was like still on staff and she, she it seemed like nothing had happened. And meanwhile, she had written me some like really condescending email 
after the fact that teacher had, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is just crazy. I, this woman is just getting away with, and the program is obviously supporting it. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. And so I, that's when I, I tried to reopen my grievance, which I, I guess I had missed some deadline because it's only got a couple weeks to do. And, yeah. and then um, the solution was, if you don't, if you really hate this school, we can try to transfer you within the system. So oh, gosh. it's kind of a boring story. No, but. no, no, no. That's a tough spot to be in. Really mm -hmm. unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, but lesson learned. Uh, yeah. Everybody at home, go through with the grievances. Don't trust the administration. Don't trust the bureaucracy. Do everything in your power to to officially make a complaint. Drive the point home, uh, because you don't know how she's connected. You don't know the the stuff she gets away with and already gets away with because she's playing the same game with everybody else. Mm -hmm. so. Well, one of the problems was, and I I shared, I made one video that where I go over a couple of my essays. And her responses. I don't know if you saw that one, but um, I shared two of what I think were nine throughout the court. It's like you said, it's a struggle session. You're supposed to put down your responses to this course, and then the teacher's like kind of guiding you through how you're supposed to be responding or what you should be thinking. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> like I said, I started out arguing in a way that I wouldn't do now because I don't think it's the right argument, but it was the most obvious argument to me was this doesn't fit me, you know, your white identity model. I don't resonate with this and here's why. And so it was all these simplistic things that she was, you know, white, this is the white experience, you know, and I'm like, well, that wasn't my experience. And so here in these journals, um, <clears throat> which were, they were called journals. You're supposed to turn one in a week with your thoughts, feelings, emotions. It's like, yeah. you know, dig deep and talk yeah. about your shit. And so I'm talking, oh, excuse me, I swore. I don't know if that's okay. That's fine. Um, but so I'm talking about my experiences and it's stuff like I shared with her a time when I was on the receiving end of domestic violence. I shared stuff that I, that just really some personal things in these, like, cause she's making these blanket statements about how this is what people of color have experienced. And this is what white, and I, a time when I had this issue with, um, anyway, I could go on, but it would be very personal. Um, but it was, that's the point. It was very personal. And part of the grievance process was a committee was going to look at my work. They were all going to sit down and read my stuff about how I don't agree with their curriculum, that they're really like loving their, this is, this is their textbook, their Daryl Wing Sue textbook and there's all of my critiques of it which i'd already been shamed and humiliated for plus all these personal details from my life which the only reason i shared them was that her syllabus said turn in your journals they are absolutely confidential your journals will not be shared unless and the, the limits to confidentiality were like you're a threat to yourself and others they're like like that standard, like psychotherapy stuff. Like if you talk to the counselor, they might have to call the authorities in. If no, I mean, if you, but if you're homicidal. forwarding white supremacy, you know, if you want to like line up people against the wall and shoot them, uh, I mean, that would be a threat, right? You would you're be a seriously a homicidal, right? Yeah. No, so, white yeah. supremacy is just it's compl complicit homicidal behavior, <sighs> yeah. right? Yeah, I guess you could make that argument. Yeah, but so. Uh, so that was why I didn't go through the grievance partly was the, yeah, I, the I level that. of yeah. scrutiny. I would just, I would have, I'm just trying to think, I would have a hard time trusting this person at all with anything. Like yeah. I would lie. I would not ever give her any power over me, but she's well, in a position. And then she working. shared my journals too. Without your consent. Without my consent. Yeah. To whom so she did. did she share? Uh, another, another um, colleague. I went into a Google drive this summer and for the first time in, you know, a couple of years, looked at those journals to pull them down for somebody else that I was, I was talking about the, the corruption and the counseling training program. Yeah. Um, and I saw that she had added another person to give access to like four of my nine journals. Huh. And so then I did file a grievance against her for breach of privacy. Mm -hmm. I just... Do you think that she knows that what she's doing is unethical 
or wrong? I think she's probably um, either in denial about that or so so righteous yeah. about what she's doing. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So it, did anything come of that grievance? They dismissed it. Oh. Mm-hmm. I tried to appeal, and they ignored my appeal. And that was one of my final straws. So you said, did it like hit a wall? Did I have a final breaking point? Yeah. My final breaking point was a couple of things. One was last year, I tried to take a trauma, grief, and loss class. And the first assignment was go into the syllabus, read the civility pledge, and post on the forum that you agree with it. And so when I read it, I was like, no, I don't agree with it. But I know that if I post that, I'm going to get, I'm going to be blacklisted in the class the whole quarter and you know this teacher's already talking about all the diversity stuff so it's not a friendly atmosphere so i just dropped the course yeah and then i um i tried to take it again a couple quarters later and the different teacher same issue so it's a course that i don't know i was just not able to take and it's a core and then i spoke with my faculty advisor about it uh, because i was concerned about how ideological the program has gotten and she said, if you don't like it, I recommend that you just get through it as quick as possible because it's going to get more intense, not less. And then she said, we are aware and we talk about in, in faculty meetings the fact that we know we're not training counselors who can work with the Trump supporter. And I thought, what is the Trump supporter? What is that? You know, like that's, that's a huge swath of people that you probably just chunked into a label and and you're not going to work with them like you're training people who can't that's how is this psychology how is this mental health and so that was another and then i yeah. the correspondence from them has just gotten so um partisan too so so like their attempts to influence the students is just so heavy what do you mean that emails from the chancellor and the provost about current events are just very partisan. It's like partisan talking points yeah. telling us how we must act and what we must do and that we should vote these people out. And, you know, it's like, wow, you're just like hmm. you're giving students a really heavy dose of influence peddling. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I saw again, uh, I saw that at Evergreen, whenever a national tragedy happened, they'd come out and say the exact same thing that every other democratic leader would say. It's like, well, one, you're just a freaking provost. Like, yeah. I'm not going to pin my hopes on you, dude. You're a balding guy who makes six figures. Like who the, who cares? Oh, eight figure, whatever. Yeah. Six figures. Um, and it was always, it always, the sl always the slant, always on, on, always going left, always moving yeah. left and always mm -hmm. in lockstep with the entire, the entire thing is all together. The Cthulhu, yes. the deep state, the whole thing. <laughs> it's like, they're all going in the same direction. That was exactly, exactly. It. You just said it. Yeah. Were you older? Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I was 36 when I started at Evergreen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've wondered like, I'm really curious and I just want to spend, I could spend forever just learning what it is that makes some people able to not conform to stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, what is it? What, what was, what do you think was your, why were you different? Well, I, I wonder about that too. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it demographically, I think it's like, uh, 10, you only need 10%, 10 radicals in the right positions to move the entire, the entire ship because 80% of people are just low resistance path of least mm -hmm. resistance. I'm just here to work. They check out, they check, they check the form and they do their job. Mm -hmm. um, and so those people will be swayed by power. And then there's always this five or 10% people who openly speak out about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I, I didn't speak out about it at Evergreen until I saw everybody else talking about Evergreen on the internet. And I didn't speak out about it at Evergreen other than like just laughing at it, you know, or chuckling because I'm like, this is just, this is dumb. This mm -hmm. is really dumb. Like, I don't know why you guys think that this is right. This is really 
just you guys are kind of weird and kooky, right? I didn't take it seriously. Like you until, thought they were just going to get over it or get a reality check at some point. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess one, one of the things that would be said on the internet and it's since been disproven that like, oh, these guys aren't going to find a job in the real world, you know, yeah. like when they get out of they're college, like, they're going to no, find a job. No, they're going like, to run the world. No, they're running the world. Yeah. Guys. Yeah. yeah they, they're, now they're teaching their, your kids. Yeah. Right? These are all the same people. So. Yeah. And this organization or, and I, I am of the mind that this is an emergent property. It's not, it's not a cabal. It's not coming from somebody designing this intentionally. This is a convergence of interests and the interests okay. are sculpted in a Darwinian process hmm. and the environment is power. The environment is having the ability to be important and mm. to make decisions, to make policy decisions and stuff. And that goes all the way up from the lobbying groups in D.C. and the lobbying groups in Hollywood, too, mm. and all of the colleges of education. And now what we're seeing is that the APA, all the professional organizations now in uh, science and uh, psychiatry and therapy, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. all now all together. And if you just mm -hmm. study the just the trans thing, specifically mm -hmm. trans youth, Mm -hmm. You can see that that they're all going in the same direction on this. They're all converging in this direction on on affirming this model. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. taking a long time. Like the New York Times, which is the probably the seat of power in our country, because it gets mm -hmm. to dictate the stories and the news. They tell the narrative. They're slowly starting to, you can see them slowly start to say, well, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe giving, a, maybe stopping puberty isn't, a good thing. Maybe, 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 mm -hmm. maybe. They just came out with an article today and it was buried under the, all this affirmation and the just little bits of... Oh, like a maybe, whisper maybe. of it. Yeah, just maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe. But if you go to the mm -hmm. professional organizations, they're run by kooks. They're just insane people. <laughs> yeah. That they're allowed to act this way because they're acting in accordance with power. The, the teacher that you're talking about is able to act unethically and mm -hmm. just be a a bad word and mm -hmm. just basically an evil person because she's acting within the purview mm -hmm. of the reigning power and everybody wants to be this sort of way. And I think it's kind of a, I take the, I'm favoring the interpretation that it's a form of Christianity. What we're watching is, is a kind of a form of a uh, particular strain of Christianity that's been, um, modified in such a way to not have any God language in it, but it's still the same mm. kind of, uh, moral uh activity that was that you see in the puritans that you see in in england and early america and protestant mm -hmm. um waspy weirdness and stuff. you think that it's happening organically not from uh, not no collective intention behind this i think it's it's a convergence of interests that's all mm -hmm. acting in the in everybody every it's all a bunch of self-motivated actors you think so yeah um and it just converges and it just, it congeals because if you actually look at it, it doesn't really make sense, mm. but everybody believes it, even though it doesn't make sense. Right. Just like the mm -hmm. Trinity, like the Trinity, like God is three persons, three persons in one. Like you can't really understand. It's designed to not be understood or to be played with. Same thing with gender. Like you can't really understand what they're talking about. You're just like, you're moving around this puzzle piece. But if you believe it, you believe it. If you don't believe it, you're bad. Mm -hmm. right? It's not about being wrong. It's about being good. But where do you think that it came from? Do you think that it just originated spontaneously and it spread from some spontaneous, like, like some small social point? What What do you think, if that's the case? Well, so I think that there's two strains of critique for this that I mm -hmm. find salient. And one way would be the James Lindsay way to understand all the foundational texts. Like, mm -hmm. and, and you do this, uh, the philosophical mm -hmm. analysis, Hegelian, Marxism, and then mm -hmm. you go through all the postmodernism stuff like that. And you kind of understand um, the theory. But the practice is, is a historical practice. And so the other way of interpreting this, uh, which I think was laid out first by an internet writer named Curtis Yarvin, and there's people who've uh, kind of distilled his work that have done some really excellent stuff. Curtis does a historical narrative. He's a Machiavellian, so he's always just thinking about the formal structures of power. And mm -hmm. he, he has a theory that this wokeness Progressivism is a form of Quaker Quakerism. Hmm. It's a form of uh, Unitarian Universalism, and, and, hmm. and it all comes. It, it's all kind of a a belief in history as a progressing that that things are always getting better. 
things are always getting better. Like mm -hmm. history, Whig history is the process of progress, right? Mm -hmm. And so all human systems are always better than the ones that happened before. And that way of thinking ends up favoring radicals that say, we're, we're on the right side of history. We're going to push this new issue. We're going to push these pronouns. We're going to push gender. We're going to push this race, racial stuff, right? And the people who believe in the racism stuff or the anti-racism mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. they believe themselves as the spiritual successors of the civil rights movement, right? But they would, if they heard Martin Luther King speak today, they would call him a fascist. Right, because mm -hmm. they're progressing. It's always mm -hmm. about progress right. and progress and progress. So then what would be your, why do you think that you, we're seeing it happen everywhere all at once? Everywhere what, all at why, once. Yeah, like why the social emotional learning coming through, the comprehensive sex ed, these are yeah. supported by United Nations and yeah. UNESCO. And so we're seeing these come from large centralized authorities yeah and so that's why i i think that there's a push from for, i think whether it whether it began more as an organic social movement and it's just been glommed onto and the technocrats are taking advantage of it or whether they are the you know the architects of it i see a push from funders and higher um bigger actors yeah and does that still fit with your well, well, the way to think about it is that everybody's acting in their own self-interest. This allows people to act collectively in their own self-interest. Um, collectivism is centralization of power. So mm -hmm. you would expect a collectivist ideology to be promulgated by uh, consolidating sources of consolidated power the UN, the USG, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. US government, um, the WF, all these people, they, they converge okay. because it, it, the ideology fits the, the program that they're operating under, which mm -hmm. is to consolidate mm -hmm. all power. So if we consolidate all power, what's the best way to consolidate all power? You break apart the family, you break mm -hmm. apart the individual, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. assign everybody some sort of quotient, like a social credit score, mm -hmm. um, and you just you use basic characteristics that everybody's already thinking of because we have all these crime stats and stuff like that. So everybody, it's really easy to think of the entire world as black and white, as Hispanic mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whatever Hispanic is. It's, it's thousands of pounds, yeah. thousands of, not, it's millions of, indivi billions of individuals, but it's the yeah. thousands of cultures, but yeah. it's Latinx or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So you can <laughs> say that it's designed by those people, but I think that it's, the people just adopted the ideology because it suits their designs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which ultimately is just self-interest. That's really interesting. So to think th of it that way. To to resist that is a tall order because you're looking at you're looking at the best funded I, they they literally are the people who are printing money. They define what money is. Mm -hmm. Like this is unlimited, like literally unlimited government, right? And mm -hmm. so if you're looking at this ideology, you'd have to, well, one, you have to constantly speak out about it, honestly and mm -hmm. sincerely, in order mm -hmm. for it to not go completely crazy. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to, like we were saying about becoming your enemy or whatever, to mm -hmm. not actually adopt the tactics of thinking that you can change the world. Because mm -hmm. either you'll become a hollow person, a pundit of some sort, mm -hmm. or, or you'll just be in despair because you can't actually change the world. So it's like mm -hmm. reduce everything to human size. Yes. Yeah. I always say shrink your world back down to the size that it actually is. Huh. Like make your circle your own circle. You what know? do you mean by that? I mean... I think that like it's easy to start to go into a crusade online and become a keyboard warrior and you know think that you can there are a few people who can do that. Yeah. There are some people who have been successful at getting a big following, but in general most of us are going to just be posting our little memes and our little screeds on Facebook or Instagram or whatever and get can get so passionate and lost in that and feel like you need to contribute to this thing when what we can actually do that would contribute most is just to be, be a healthy whole person in your own life and connect on an individual level with the people that are around you and deprogram ourselves and de 
turn it off, turn off the screens. Don't spend all day on the screen obsessing about the problems of the world. Yeah. Just, you know, a couple hours, maybe <laughs> get your Benjamin voice. Yeah. In, yeah. We'll just it. go on a walk, <laughs> watch the podcast. Or yeah. Whatever, yeah. Walk, no, I grass. mean, I, I think within balance, right? Like yeah, there's yeah. some balance you, you have to, we're, we can't just like put the genie back in the bottle and well, go back to having an analog life, but we can, we can strive towards more analog. Yeah. And I think that that's where we make our, we make our communities healthier. We make our families healthier and we make ourselves healthier. And it's just like, think of, think of humanity as an organism. It's kind of like a siphonophore, you know, like a collective. Yeah. Like a collected organism that is, is made up of individual organisms that are all living it on their, you know, they come together and, and become a larger thing. So we're, um, like yeast, yeast, I guess. Are we I the, the yeast infection of the world? Is that what you're calling humanity? <laughs> like, uh oh, you really are an environmentalist. Yeah. No, I hadn't thought of that. That's interesting. I don't want to be a yeast infection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I want to ask right. you a question that Sasha Ayad would make fun of me for asking, but you brought up okay. a whole, be a whole person. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, whole person? Mm, what does it mean to be a whole person? Yeah, okay, so the social justice activism has a st strong, uh, it's strong because it can say, we're going to split the person, we're going to split the atom. Mm -hmm. we, we know what this is, and then we're going to define everything according to privilege and oppression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the, uh, if there's an alternative health, uh, human health, human mental health model, I would assume that at the basic basis of that is some notion of health or mm -hmm. some notion of the person you used whole person. So what is the, the, the attributes of a whole person? Mm, I guess that would be, oh, that's so you're challenging me a little bit there because I'm going to have to try to articulate that. Um, I think that one thing in in our we have such a fractured sense of identity in the culture right now this idea that you are your identities and this is one of the things that i really reject about the social justice mindset is that we are a collection of different identities like i can have um i can measure myself based on like all these characteristics and qualities i think it it really um it forces this sort of continual navel gazing like self-examination that is more narcissistic than introspective and that's so, a really good distinction i'd like you to expand on that but finish your thought yeah so i think like actually actually figuring out how what what do you value what are your values and how do you connect to the people that you that you care about and you know are you a part of something real in your life um, do you get off the internet for one thing i think internet is you know and again you can <laughs> watch benjamin voice but everything else just just kidding how, um, how how many hours a day are your kids allowed to be on the internet Little ones are nine and 11 years old and so they don't zero. get screen time. Okay. No, no screen time. Not at all. Excellent. No, we don't have a television. We don't do screens. They don't oh. have video games. We do not do any screens. Okay. Mm -hmm. We, I'll let them watch a, we'll do a family movie. We have a projector. We'll put that up once every couple of weeks. And You're like, like you go out to like the, the real uh, <laughs> rental place. You get like the big, like 35 millimeter reels. You cart them home. No. <laughs> you go, We're going to watch Pollyanna guys. And you load yeah, up. Yeah, we just do charades <laughs> actually. It's like live action. Just put up <laughs> no. Hmm. But yeah, we. I know it's kind of an extreme position in today's world, but I don't, I think that it's, it's good to foster your own imagination. You know, read a book, go for a walk, just experience what it is to actually be alive instead of this weird like like semi hallucinate you know what, what am i trying to say not hallucinate but like uh like uh hypnotized i guess yeah. is the word i was going to say like this hypnotic like interaction that we have with mm. with uh 
the screen. You, you just kind of zone in. Like I've noticed it since I started doing these videos. It's really weird because I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not a, I don't, I'm, I like my life is real. I've got my actual real friends, my real clients. I see a couple people that I see online, but mostly my computer time is very minimal. Huh. And uh, now I'm here, I'm like reading all these comments and I can feel myself like getting sucked right in. And it's so strange. Yeah. yeah. But it is I didn't answer your question very well. No, that's fine. That's fine. You think so? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what's the difference between narcissistic and introspective? What, what are the quality difference of those two activities? I, you could probably find somebody to give you a better answer than I could give you, but I'll, I think um, narcissistic is like, you're just, you're just examining your image. You're just thinking about how you, how do I, how do I strike people? What do I, what am I like? I'm, I'm looking for okay. a mirror, really. It's like just uh, reflecting back this, this outwardly projected self examining the outward, outward projections of self. So it's sort of a, a combination of like, um, like uh, cruel scrutiny and vanity. And then introspection is like, um, like a quest for deeper understanding of self, deeper understanding, like what why did I do that? Why did I say that? What should I have done? And how could I be? And what can we do moving forward? How do I connect? It's, it's more about like the quality of self than the reflection of self is what yeah. I would say. Yeah. I mean, off the cuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's really good. Um, and that does translate into um, one angle of change making in the culture would be to try to upload the introspective to try to interrupt the narcissism of the screen and the hypnosis right mm -hmm. kind of like shattering the fourth wall but that shattering of the fourth wall actually opens up onto humanity rather than just commentary right? mm -hmm. and into insight rather than just distraction mm -hmm. so yeah, and I think we have like we have such an expert driven culture right now hmm. where it feels like like you described that feeling of not being able to speak up when you were hearing all these voices around you and you're like, Well, surely they're gonna come to their senses. I don't really need to speak up. But also why would I speak up? Why would it be me to do it? You know, somebody who knows better is gonna come along and say hmm. the right thing. And hmm. I think there's this idea that that somebody who knows better is going to come along and articulate it better. And I think that it, that part of being whole is, is kind of balancing that those outward influences that we have with our own gut and our own, our own impression and not being afraid to say something that might sound silly, you know, and it, it's just your synthesis is your own take on things. And we should be, less afraid to be a fool and just, huh. just feel it, you know, say yeah. it. And, you know, I think a, a, uh, a, not a desire, uh, but the lack of caring of being seen as the fool is one aspect of being the person that stands out, mm -hmm. stands up, sticks out mm -hmm. it's like, you know, so, You'll see probably a lot of tricksters. You you would have supposed that co comedy would lead the charge, but even the comedic community you know, has been taken yeah. over by this. Um, yeah. If you see the, uh, you know, David Chappelle is one of the guys who sticks out, and there's a few other comedians who are able to get away with saying certain things. But I didn't watch the entire episode, but he was just on Saturday Night Live, and I watched his, I watched like the first half of his monologue, and I knew I was laughing so hard, like I was, I was just like laughing really hard um, because of the way that he was speaking and what he was speaking out and what he was speaking to. And, uh, and I knew that the rest of that episode would be total crap. I mean, I already know mm. that Saturday Night Live is total crap, but especially being following like something that Chappelle something brought like that. Yeah. But he, but he was able to kind of speak truth to power, but then he started 
playing into the crowd. You, you know, mm-hmm. he, he moved away mm-hmm. from the edgy stuff and started to, you know, throw the bones to the democratic dogs, right? Like, okay, we're going to make It's like a sandwich. People. Like he had to sandwich it in there among yeah. a lot of um, positive saying signals. the right thing. Yeah. 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 Like a complaint sandwich. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm wondering, like, but in the middle of a struggle session, how do you maintain composure? How do you not give in to that psychological intensity of being put on the spot and then told to reparent yourself, told to reprogram yourself? How do I, or how does How would one? Mm. Is that the moment to speak up? I think just, I think that the best thing to do if you're really unsure, or the best for me, um, is just to give it some thought and don't react right Mm. away. You know, come back to, you know, let your, those things, the, that experience is very, it's very emotional. I mean, your adrenaline is up, you're humiliated, you're, you're, you're feeling called out. You're also, if, if you're a person who values or thinks of yourself as compassionate and empathetic and somebody's calling you a label that is the opposite and yeah. you're, you know, that can be really jarring. And so... The challenge is not to react in the moment, but to give it some thought and see how it fits. And like, am I going to own this? Am I going to take this on? Or or is this not not accurate? And then come back with a more measured response. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that works in favor of this ideology is a sense of urgency or a sense of impending doom and, and utter urgency um, mm-hmm. that turns off brains. Mm-hmm. And I saw that very explicitly when I was kind of struggle sessioned in the middle of the evergreen mess. Like I just looked at them, like I gave mm. them this, like, are you, are you kidding? Right. Look, but I knew not to respond because anything. So that was, was your same take. Just same like, thing. yeah, j- but just no kind reaction. of like, it just reminded me, uh, working with kids, you know, like when, when a kid's trying to control you and you can. You can either enter into that power struggle and lose, Mm -hmm. or you can not. And there's different ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. Kind of a condescension, like you're an idiot. You're a total Mm -hmm. idiot, but I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to let you know that I know that and that you probably (laughs) know that too, right? And you're going to look back on this eventually, but maybe you won't, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, it is important to remain whole, I guess. And, mm-hmm. and to have a sense of, of time and reality that isn't the walls falling down, the sky is falling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wonder, that's, you know, being older, I think, is a protection. I think it's a protective um, factor. Well, it might not protect your job, but it might protect your sanity a bit. Yeah, in terms of, like, staying, being, I, I, I guess protective maybe is the wrong, I should, should have said con- contributing factor to being able to, resist some of those things like I really felt like I there were a couple of older students in the program I wasn't the oldest but I was you know among the older group of people in my graduate program and a couple of them left like within the first two quarters and I I never was told why one of them was a really great lady she was she was wonderful I think she I hope I hope she got into another program somewhere else and and is working in the field that she wants to work. But um, after all of this sort of, after I understood it a little bit better, I wondered, and I I bet that this was why they left. They couldn't put up with the woke stuff. But um, Hmm. yeah, I thought that the thing that maybe made it easier for me to call it out, even though it was hard for me to call it out, uh, was being older and being more, I think we, we settle into ourself, you know, that, settling into your identity and not being able to be pushed around as much. Yeah. So these young kids who are in their early twenties, I think this is, it's gotta be tremendously difficult. Well, yeah. Again, it's this institution that you have a bunch of people running it that have never been outside of it. And then you have a bunch Mm -hmm. of kids who've never been outside of it either. So there's this, the possibility for an utter distortion of reality, yeah. another yeah. like mass formation psychosis, mm-hmm. um, because they're they're all insulated, and then somebody arrives that's been out there, you know, having kids and growing mm-hmm. natural medicines or whatever, <laughs> and then you come, you walk into this thing, you're like, wait, are you guys serious? And you mm-hmm. don't belong, so they kick you out. So they're you're they're reinforced. 
And mm-hmm. because they own everything, all the accreditation, like you can't even participate outside of that system with that system stamp of approval. You need the stamp of approval because the system's also connected to the government that it regulates everything else. So it's like this, mm-hmm. <laughs> this mm-hmm. huge thing. I do think we're going to see more and more parallel um, industries cropping up, though. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that there's like I feel very freed by the idea of working as a coach. I started a coaching practice last year and um, I I really find it hmm. rewarding. And, and what is a coach? You just rah, rah, rah. That's a cheerleader. I know. It sounds like that. I don't like the word. I haven't gotten used to the word yeah, coach. It's like partner. I was going to school to be a counselor, not a coach. And the coach sounds too like, you go get them. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a word I really like, but it's just a, you know, unlicensed helping professional. You can get coaching certificates. There's stu- you could be a life coach. You could be a health coach. You could be whatever. But basically, you're just, you're just doing in one-on-one or, or group work with people who are looking to, you know, work on self-improvement with a partner. And so I use my, I use the counseling training, counseling sort of concepts and skills to work with people. I just, there's no medical element. I'm not doing any diagnosis. I'm not doing any psychiatric treatment. It's not anything like that. It's more like peer to peer. I have, I have some training. I have some, uh, mostly what I can bring is a genuine interest in hearing what's going on and working through pattern recognition and you can do Uh, some, you know, some examination together. And it's really, I think that more people are going that way. I'm seeing more people who have been licensed, letting their license lapse and choosing to still work with clients. And I, I think thankfully as this, as there becomes more recognition of how captured the psychology professions are, um, there's still, a parallel industry that can step in. Yeah. Speaking of which you have mm-hmm. a parallel industry blog on Substack. Are mm-hmm. you also connected <laughs> with say critical theory antidote or any other organizations? Yeah. Critical therapy antidote. Yeah. Therapy antidote. Mm-hmm. How did you get mm-hmm. connected with them and what's their deal? So I saw an article that Val wrote in, I want to say it was like on new discourses. This would have been, either late 2019 or early 2020 when I was just kind of being confronted by this and trying to figure out what I thought of it all and, and how it made sense. And I, I found yeah. James Lindsay about that time and that was really helpful. He's great. Yeah. And um, I have, I've read and listened to hours and hours and hours of him. So he's, he's been helpful in, in understanding this. And I, I came across this article that um that Val, who is the founder of, of CTA, had put on. Val, um, uh, what's her? Thomas, name? I think. Val Thomas. Thomas. Val. Right. Yeah. She's in the UK. She's fantastic. And um, so she started this, this group, and it's a collection of psychologists, counselors, therapists. Coaches. And, uh, yeah, there's a couple coaches <laughs> and, um, and students in, in oh. the field to connect on issues around um, our concern about the ideological takeover of the profession. So it's a wonderful, wonderful resource. And it's a resource for um, people who are seeking therapists that are not ideological. Also, you can write in and and get connected to somebody. They have a directory. So yeah, yeah, that's been a great, um, I have, some very good friends through there that I've gotten to know and that we, we, you know, can bounce ideas off of each other and give support. It's wonderful. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is the theme of your sub stack? What, what do you see emerging there? You only have like 15, 20 articles at this point, but something like that. I only have, um, I, I'd written a couple of articles for CTA over the past year or so about different aspects of how the the social justice, critical social justice theory impacts um, counselor training and potentially client work as well. So I'd written a couple of those and I reposted those to my Substack. So those are on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I started the Substack as a way to share 
documents after I, I posted this first YouTube video, I guess it was about a month ago, maybe, maybe three, three or four weeks ago. And one of the comments under it, I was just supposed, it's just this little short video where I just said, I'm concerned about these things. This is my experience. And one of my comments that I got was, do you have any proof of this? And so yeah. I made a follow up and I, I wanted to kind of go through, yes, I have proof. I'll show you. I'm not just, yeah. And so then I posted all those documents to Substack because I want people to be able to kind of go over them themselves. And I think this is really concerning. So are your uh, juicy journals on there too? With all of your no. Past oh, I did put two, <laughs> two of them, not the juicy ones. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> just the ones I did a video about okay. They're They're only, there's only a tiny bit of juice. <laughs> just a drop just a drop you gotta get that outrage engine a little bit <laughs> running in your favor just a little bit you know yeah a little self-exploitation yeah. never hurt no one a little bit <laughs> maybe i don't know i'm i this the whole internet thing is very like being seeing my face on video oh my gosh it's very strange so yeah. i don't know well thanks for showing up on my internet yeah. And thanks uh, for talking to me. Yeah. Uploading your soul into my collection of souls. <laughs> I have a, another project that I'm working on too. What is it? Um, I'm working with, uh, with Jody Shaw. I think. Oh yeah. Met Jody. Um, and two other colleagues were working on um, a new support uh, system. It's going to be an online uh, peer support organization. It's called solid ground. You can go to solidgroundsupport.com and get on the waiting list. We're, we're launching on um, January 1st, and we will have group and individual support for people going through um, re the mental anguish of authoritarian yeah. garbage. So the, the canceled it's, it's going to be great. Yeah. 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 Huh. And what, what, are, what are some of the methodologies that you guys are basing this on? This is peer support. Yeah. So we can offer help in terms of just having people to connect with because a lot of the, a lot of what's going on is it just makes you feel so isolated and alone. Okay. And so having somebody that you can talk to either one on one or in a group is really helpful. Also having somebody you can work with who's been there and can help you strategize your okay. responses to yeah. you know what's going on in, if it's maybe in, in your school or your home life or your yeah. yeah yeah so just peer support and strategy partners and yeah. and again that's solid ground support dot dot com com okay i think so yeah cool. do you guys have cookies i hope so okay bring right bring your own cookies i will accept your cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well leslie elliott thank you so much for your time um and thanks for the work that you're doing. A lot of people uh, really are uh, touched and moved by what you're doing and insisted that I speak with you. So your oh, voice is not, nice. you're not crying out in the wilderness alone. People are, people are hearing and getting uh, meaning from your work. So thanks. I'm thanks. glad I, my biggest fear when I put that video out was that it would be met by a big, so what from everybody. Cause it was already that spread, you know, that it was, yeah. So seeing, seeing that has been enormously encouraging about where we're at. There you go. Your coach at large. Is there another <laughs> word that you had to use? I like, wish. If you think of right? one, let me know. I don't like coach, yeah, but like you know, coach. I've gotten a little more used to it. Yeah. Consultants, but that sounds kind of Life top consultant. down, doesn't it? Yeah. I know. Doesn't it sound condescending? Like a consultant. Well, I mean, people need consultants all the time, but it's kind of, it, it doesn't have a it doesn't friendly have the right flavor. Feel. Yeah. 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 But coach yeah. has like a sweaty kind of thing going on there. <laughs> the ball cap. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, and I, like, I'm going to have a ball and a mitt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll catch your heart. <laughs> Just swing and a miss, swing and a miss. We'll get you out the form. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to, in the recording, want to say goodbye to the folks. Okay. Thank you.